briefly again, um, but this time to talk about a project uh, that we have starting up, um, which is this one that you can see on the title, uh, The Legal and Social Dynamics of E-Book Lending. Um, so this is a new adventure that Rebecca and I are embarking on. Um, after all, one good project deserves another. Um, and this project, this is an ARC uh, linkage project, with, with the, which we're doing with a number of library partners. Um, and it's motivated by the realisation that e-books pose a bit of a challenge um, for libraries in a range of ways. Um, they can uh, pose a challenge in terms of pricing. The pricing for e-books um, can often be higher than it is for physical equivalents. Uh, there's bundling issues when libraries are wanting to uh, lend e-books. You might be able to buy a book, but only if you buy 500 of the other titles that are available, um, which can raise prices but also reduce the role that libraries play in curation. Um, libraries risk uh, losing titles, um, particularly uh, around the area of platform lock-in. So you, do, you go into a platform, you get access to a certain number of um, titles, and then if you decide that platform isn't working for you and you want to move to a new platform, you may lose access to a whole lot of titles that people want. Um, the fact of that cost can make libraries vulnerable to things like price hikes. Um, in some cases, we have quite restrictive licensing uh, around e-books. For example, you might have license terms that say you can lend this book out, say, 20 or 25 times, and then you have to buy it again. Um, compare that, of course, to a physical book where you can loan it out until it falls apart and then you fix it and then you loan it out again. Um, we have licences that uh, contract out of exceptions as well, um, including the important fair dealing exceptions. We have uh, problems sometimes with the software. Um, the software may be quite clunky. I know as someone who relies on e-books um, in my university library quite a lot that Many of the uh, platforms are really very clunky um, and they restrict things that I might like to do, particularly as a researcher, for example, copying small snippets of text that I would have a legitimate right to quote. Um, so we have all of these things that go on around e-books and if you've used much, many e-books in libraries, you'll see um, a lot of these problems and more fundamentally, you may see the problem that uh, some books simply aren't available for e-lending at all. So books that libraries might wish to lend out, um, they can only get, for example, in a physical uh, version. Um, and so these sorts of issues motivated us to start looking at these questions of e-books. Um, and why, uh, why it is that e-books are regulated so differently from uh, physical books. Now, as a matter of law, we kind of know why that is, right? Because people in this audience know Copyright gives a range of exclusive rights. Those rights include the right to make copies, to publish, to perform in public, to communicate and to make adaptations. What you won't see there, of course, is the right to lend out. There's no exclusive right to lend out um, a physical book. Um, we also know about contract. And we know a couple of really important principles in contract. Um, including these two, just to you know, remind those of you who haven't studied contract like me since they went to law school. Um, if you're party to a contract, you have to do what you say you're going to do. Um, but contract only binds you to what you agree to. There's this principle called privity of contract that means that if A agrees a contract with B, that contract doesn't bind C over here. Now, you think about how that applies uh, to things like physical books. Um, and what that means is that acquiring and lending out physical books firstly doesn't in invoke the copyright rights of the copyright owner. You buy it, you buy a legitimate copy, and then everything you do afterwards with that copy um, in terms of lending out the book doesn't implicate copyright owner's rights. Um, and secondly, it means that libraries actually don't have to enter what, what that means is that libraries don't have to enter a contract with a publisher in order to lend the book out, right? Um, and that's important because it means that publishers can't charge a different price to libraries, right? Publishers could try, they could say, we'll sell a book to a consumer for $10, but because that book in the library is gonna be loaned out lots of times, we'll sell that to you for $100, sell it to the library for $100. Well, if the publisher tried to do that, 
the library would just go to a reseller and buy it for $11, <laughs> a consumer copy. Um, now, another implication of all of this, of course, is that libraries don't have to pay ongoing fees to lend out books. You might be aware, of course, that Australian authors do get payments when libraries stock their books. Um, those are the public lending rights, but that's funded from government revenue and it's not coming from libraries' budgets according to how many people borrow the book. Um, now, what changes when we deal with e-books? Well, acquiring and lending e-books inevitably involves the rights of the copyright owner. Every time you lend out a book to someone and they download it onto their Kindle or whatever their device is, that's a copy. Moreover, because you're lending it out to a member of the public, that's a communication to the public. So every loan implicates the copyright owner's rights. That means the copyright owner has the right to license that. You need a license from the copyright owner to do that. Um, and so what we see is that uh, e-books, you need permission, you need the license, um, and that means that some of those things that were true in the physical environment are no longer true in this electronic environment. So a publisher can charge a different price. They can charge $100 for the e-book um, because you need to get a license and you can't go and buy the consumer version because you need the license to let, then lend it out. So this all has a whole lot of implications um, and this slide just really summarises it, right? So in the context of digital, you need the, the publisher's permission. You might have to give up exceptions because you're forming a contract with the publisher. Um, you can lose titles um, rather than retaining them until they're worn out, or you ha may have to rebuy titles if they turn out to be particularly popular. Um, you can be charged more than consumers. Um, and if a library budget, say, goes down from year to year, that could mean that you lose a whole lot of books if you can no longer pay a licence fee. Again, compare that to the budget re-implications of physical books where you know, a fall in the budget just means you buy less books, but you don't lose the books you've already got. So this is all really important because this changes the way that libraries can perform their functions, particularly that access function that we've just been hearing about. Um, so, a couple of things to think about, which is that we never made a decision that said e-books should be treated differently from physical books, or libraries should have to deal with e-books in a completely different way, or contract for e-books in a completely different way. It's just a function of digital, and it's a function of the way that we've written copyright law. Um, the second thing is that we don't really know what that means. We don't have a lot of evidence about how this different treatment of e-books might be affecting libraries' abilities to fulfil their public interest missions, might be affecting, for example, how they can reach regional or disadvantaged communities um, or the like. And that brings us to the project. And at this point, I'm going to hand over. I'm going to do my elegant crab move. <laughs> which I think might really catch on. All right, so what are we doing to remedy this situation? Well, um, these, remarkable, uh, these remarkable things, the fact that we've got this very different regulatory situation for e-books, yet a third um, remarkable thing is that there has been no research yet to sort of really understand that. And so we have been awarded this uh, major ARC linkage grant to investigate these issues, and we're building on some really terrific preliminary work that have been done by uh, APLA, Alia, and others to investigate developing practices around ebook lending, um, and also to analyze the social impacts of the current approaches. So I'll just quickly introduce the project team. Uh, so of course there's Kim and myself bringing expertise across the copyright and contract side and some experience um, with empirical interdisciplinary research. Uh, we've also got Julian Thomas, who's now over at RMIT. Lots of you will know him from his work with digital inclusion in the, in, in the library space as well, and some of you will have heard him speak at Alia last week. Um, 
he and his uh, team are involved in this project to help us on the sociological and, and media and communication side. And we've got Jeff Webb and Francois Petitjean, uh, who are some of um, you know, really world-leading data scientists here based at Monash uh, with me. Uh, and they're contributing machine learning and time series analysis and some really cool AI stuff to the project. Joining the CI team, we have uh, formally, we've got eight uh, library partners. We've had fantastic support from NISLA, the state libraries of WA, uh, South Australia and New South Wales in their own right, uh, and ALIA, and various um, individual public library organisations. Uh, informally, we've also uh, got partnerships with a number of other library institutions, both in Australia and overseas, including partners in New Zealand, the US and Canada. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of people that I've seen around today, um, Margaret Allen, um, Sarah Steed, uh, Suma Karacha, uh, who are all involved in the project and probably others that I've missed. Okay, so what you can see, one of the really, really cool things about this is that we combine serious library expertise with uh, research expertise across a range of, um, of areas that is going to um, give us the ability to be the very first ones in the world to develop an evidence base about what it actually means for libraries when we regulate e-books um, in the way that we do and, and, and what those changes actually mean for society. And so to do that, we're going to be collecting and analysing data across these three different dimensions. Uh, first of all, availability. What kinds of e-books are available to libraries for e-lending? Um, so, for example, how many of the top 100 books that are most held in, in um, physical form in Australia's public libraries, uh, as determined by the, the list held for the purposes of um, applying the public lending right, how many of those are available to libraries to license as e-books? What about the books that have won major literary prizes in Australia, like the, the Prime Minister's um, or the, 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 the Miles Franklin? Um, and we're going to be comparing availability also with those international partners to see how it's different for uh, libraries in the US, in Canada and in New Zealand. The kinds of things that we're really interested in finding out, um, getting some data around, are uh, things like, well, how long does it actually take for an e-book to become available to libraries for e-lending compared to the physical equivalent? How does genre and population and geographic location impact on availability? And does the number of loans when an ebook is available to libraries have a negative impact on its future availability? Our second axis is access. Uh, books may be available without actually being accessible. And the project's also going to develop that evidence base around what terms. What are the terms on which libraries can obtain access to ebooks? So we're going to be looking at the relative pricing of ebooks and physical books to libraries and consumers, the restrictions that are imposed on the number and duration of loans, uh, that practice of bundling that Kim mentioned at the start, where maybe you can license a book, but you've also got to license 500 or even 1,000 more in order to do so, and that issue of lock-in. Um, and our preliminary work on that, you know, it's, it's already very, very interesting to see how, in fact, um, the commercial realities, the commercial arrangements um, that are being reached is that provider lock-in is presenting less of a barrier than it has in the past because new aggregators are popping up and reaching agreements with publishers to allow transfer. So it's a really, really interesting development of how practice is flowing around the law to make this work a little bit better than it otherwise would. Um, and looking, of course, at things like the practices around libraries having to give up copyright exceptions, um, impacts on preservation and reader privacy, and um, the relative cost. We'd really, we would like to know what's the relative cost to a library of lending out an e-book compared to a physical book, and what's the difference in how much of that cost, that price, actually makes its way to the author, um, given that we don't have a public lending right, but instead these sort of ongoing fees in the e-book context. Now, the third axis is readership, and this is where we're getting to some really, really interesting stuff. Uh, because there's not much known at the moment that about if an ebook is available to libraries for e lending, who's actually reading that? To, uh, to really assess the impact of um, ebook uh, regulation, we need to know a bit more about the social distribution of library use. 
uh, which Australians are using libraries um, and which Australians in particular are using e-books. And so we want to really get a better understanding of the social characteristics of e-book users and how they, um, how they interrelate with use. So there's a whole bunch of things that we're going to be looking at um, in order to in order to, um, to, to find this out. Uh, we're going to be, once we've gathered uh, all of the primary data, we're going to be using a range of social, legal, uh, and data science techniques to analyze it to help us draw some conclusions about how uh, or what the social impacts of library e-lending practices currently are. But the overarching focus is going to be on how the existing regulatory framework is um, interfering with libraries' abilities to fulfill those public interest missions. So we are only six months in, but we do have some early uh, progress just in the, um, that, that, that we do want to share with you today, just a sneak peek about the kinds um, of things that we're working on and the kind of understanding that might result. Most of our partners use uh, multiple ebook platforms, but just about all of them share in common Overdrive, which some of you might uh, use in your libraries uh, or you might use as a reader. Um, and uh, we've, we've had great cooperation from Overdrive, and as a result, we've been able to automate the collection of anonymous checkout data from that across um, a whole bunch of our partners uh, that, that um, have opted into this exercise. And so what we've got is we've managed to get the, the records of every individual <coughs> checkout across all of Western Australia, all of South Australia, and all of Tasmania so far. And I think ACT uh, is going to be joining in the next few days. Um, and so we're talking now several million records, which is you start to get an idea about why it's so essential to us to have the big data guys on board. Um, all so, anonymized, by the way. Yeah, so let me, let me, let me, let me show you what we're collecting. Yeah, let me show you what we're collecting so that you can see this. Um, and that's the important point that Kim mm -hmm. um, is emphasizing, that one right on the last bit. We do have a unique identifier that's completely non-identifiable of the borrower. Okay, so it's, um, there's, there's not going to be any individuals identified at all in this. But you can start to see these are the categories um, of information that we've got for each of the loans. And you can start seeing the potential for us to develop some new understanding about what's actually happening in this space that's really unprecedented, that no one's ever been able to understand before. Um, so if you look, for example, we can see the library branch. And one of the things that we're going to do is get our partners to code their branches. Um, is it remote? Is it regional? Is it an urban branch? And you can, uh, we can also tie that in with some um, uh, other demographics um, and particularly socioeconomic factors by coding those branches to ABS data linked to the postcode where they're located as a some sort of, sort of proxy for the socioeconomic um, characteristics of, of the people who are living there. And then you start thinking about um, the amount of time that we've got. I think our earliest available records stretch right back to 2006, continuously right till now. So we've, we've got the ability now to ask some, some really interesting kinds of questions. Like we can use um, the, the data science methods to tell us what are the different types of users who are actually borrowing ebooks, and what are their characteristics, and how do their borrowing patterns change over time? And are there differences depending on whether they are urban or remote or regional users? Does the number and type of um, checkouts change depending on, upon the genre, upon the audience, upon the language? That's something we're going to be able to look at. Does, for example, if somebody starts borrowing ebooks uh, in Chinese, do they persist longer or for less time than people in English? And what about other languages? Right? And what are, these, what are these differences and what can that tell us about the audiences that are being served by ebook collections and the gaps that might exist? Um, and uh, we've also been able to get some, some kind of cool bonuses from, from just this preliminary work with the database. We've been able to um, just very quickly spot, for example, just comparing the, the data from all of South Australia to all of Western Australia. We've been able to say, well, here are the top 100 books that are held in the South Australian collection based on the number of checkouts that are not held in WA. And um, the WA librarian said, oh, that's very interesting. Well, we're going to buy those and vice versa. <laughs> All right, so just, there's a, there's just filling some gaps and finding some information um, that hasn't been there before. So 
that's just a sneak peek about what we're doing, but really essentially what we're doing here is developing this, um, this evidence base, this new data and analysis that's gonna give libraries really valuable new understanding of, of what's actually happening with their readers and their readership. And we're gonna be generating as well tools and methods um, and data that will hopefully help libraries make better informed decisions about their uh, spending their collections budgets. So for example, one of the cool things that we should be able to do by based on having a look at this at title level, um, we'll be able to assess kind of the half-life of books and or different kinds of books. And then libraries will be able to use that information to work out, well, if they've been confronted with the choice of several different types of license for this kind of book, the one that's most likely um, to be the most efficient use of money would be this, right? So a model of anticipated demand. Um, and another thing that's really interesting, some libraries have developed a suspicion that the most popular titles might be being withdrawn from e-lending at higher rates than the less popular titles. And that's a hypothesis that we'll be able to test by looking at the ones that have been removed from the collection and comparing that to the ones that do remain. So some empirical data to, to prove or disprove that hypothesis. Um, we're, uh, ultimately, what we're trying to do is, uh, in addition to the, the short and medium term um, new information to help libraries better understand the readership, formulate some data-driven options for policy and law reform that do reflect um, the legal constraints on reform, particularly that international treaty framework that we've heard a little bit about today, um, and of course, that reflect the sometimes competing and sometimes complementary interests of everybody that's involved. So the libraries, the readers, the publishers, the authors, uh, the aggregators, everybody. Um, we're hoping that this is going to inform some decision making at the domestic and international level. Um, and particularly in Australia, to inform the debate about whether in fact the public lending rights should be extended to e-books. That's something uh, that has been tossed around for a really long time now, but there's no data to explain the case and for us to understand what the implications would be. So finally, we're going to be able to create that. Um, so yeah, that's basically what we're up to. Um, really, what it's about is, is just recognizing that for so many people and populations, libraries are the ones that, that provide those really important opportunities for learning and growth and social connection that wouldn't otherwise be available to them. But not everyone can physically get to a library. And so by helping libraries uh, and policymakers understand the impacts of the current regulatory approach to e-lending, we're trying to maximize libraries' abilities to, to serve that to every population. So thank you so much, uh, and we would love to hear your questions. <laughs> Margaret. Hi, I'm just curious about whether uh, uh, is there a split between fiction and non-fiction? Are you principally dealing with fiction? Because I know Overdrive is principally fiction. Yeah, um, yeah that's right. So we, did, we had to make some cuts at some point when we were scoping the project. And so we had to, we separated out between public libraries uh, and academic libraries. And then we had to really, we did focus more on the, the fiction offerings. Um, but the idea is that this will hopefully be transferable later on. All of this knowledge and understanding will be transferable to follow up projects where then we can take this understanding and apply it to those other contexts. Okay, I mean, we I had to leave out audiobooks as well. So a few cuts here and there to make something manageable we could deliver in the three years. I mean, the issue is the same. It's just yeah. good for us to know about the scope. Yeah, yeah. Uh, firstly, congratulations on getting another linkage grant, uh, or getting a linkage <laughs> grant up uh, at all. My understanding is very difficult these days. Um, look, my question is, uh, my understanding is that it may not be possible to determine whether the books are actually read. Um, I have a friend who's a hearty user of an uh, of e-lending library in Diamond Creek uh, outside of Melbourne and Victoria. And, um, and she's a very enthusiastic uh, borrower. But I know for a fact that at least half, if not three quarters of the books that she downloads, um, she, doesn't, she hasn't the capacity to read because the duration of which she's able to borrow them does not give her the time to, uh, to actually read the material. 
so that, that is something that we have raised with the libraries. They pay per checkout, regardless of whether it's ever sort of opened or downloaded under your typical library contract. Um, and that's something, you know, it's, it's interesting because when you look at the, the various structures for um, treating ebooks and the different lending models and so on, um, there's some ways where um, the, there's an insistence on treating it the same as a physical book, um, like a one copy, one user sort of model. And there's other cases where there's insistence on very different treatment, for example, 26 loans and then it's worn out. Um, and there's certainly scope um, and I think libraries are starting to think about this in their negotiations for saying, well, actually, if it's different from a physical book, if it wears out magically after 26 loans, then perhaps we want it built into the technology to make sure that at least, say, 10% of the book has actually been viewed before we, one of those loans counts. Um, otherwise, it's just like browsing, which wears it out a lot less. Um, so there's really scope for this, but um, at the moment, your typical library contract uh, counts each of those as a loan, regardless of whether it's actually opened. Another point worth noting is that we are actually doing some talking to readers, and this is part of the work that Julian in particular is doing. So we're not just looking at this checkout data that no. Rebecca's been talking about. No. There's, there's other aspects of the project where we'll be able to explore exactly those questions. Yeah, so I should mention uh, that we've got the, the, the qualitative side that is complementary to the quantitative stuff that I was predominantly talking about with the update. Uh, and we do have extensive reader surveys uh, and librarian surveys and focus groups as well. We're going to, once we find out a little bit more from the preliminary data, we'll, we'll really drill down into those reasons and those practices as well. Um, Rita Matolinte from Newcastle Law School. Well, congratulations, it's a very interesting project. Uh, I had just, can you hear me? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I just had a suggestion actually. I see that you are covering jurisdictions like US, Canada, New Zealand, but you leave out Europe. Mm. But Europe actually at the moment has very interesting developments of the topic. Just last, like end of 2016, the European Court of Justice decided that um, kind of to extend so-called public lending right exception with, uh, to e-books, which means now that libraries uh, do not have to sign licenses anymore mm -hmm. uh, with publishers for e-books, as long as this PLR schemes, you know, compensate authors. And now, just now I saw online that UK has adopted the law um, to implement this exception. So I thought it would be very interesting to see from uh, like uh, what's going on in Europe as well, if you're talking about policy and regulate like solutions, uh, like about this need uh, of e-lending exception in yeah, it's, Australia it's, as well. It's probably worth emphasizing that um, when we're talking about the sort of New Zealand and Canada and the like, what we're talking there about principally is these are partners that we're working with to see what's available. Um, and, I mean, fortunately, we have you know, people we're talking to in the UK. I don't think we've got anyone actually signed up in the UK. Yeah, unfortunately, the library situation in the UK itself is just so incredibly dire in terms of the resourcing and so on that it's not no feasible. No, no, they're all... I did have a really nice... Uh, if a little bit harried meeting with one person in, at a, a public library in London last year, and she said, I'm very sorry, but I have to leave now. I'm going to apply for early retirement because they just made my entire team redundant, and goodbye. Uh, <laughs> uh, and that's basic, uh, and uh, that was after an hour of her talking just about how incredibly dire it is. But of course, yeah, that, that decision um, in Europe is incredibly important, and, and it was perfect timing that that they came down mm. shortly after we got the grant. And so that's really what we're heading towards. Once we've got all of the data, the question, that one of the questions we're going to have to ask is, should we be following the European model? Um, is that what the data suggests is the best way of regulating this subject to the, of course, to the equitable remuneration being paid to the, the copyright owners? And it's a fascinating time to be studying these questions, particularly because of that development. Um, John from EFA again, this is uh, uh, quite a quick one and probably I suspect a little bit out of scope of what you're doing but I think you know you talked about access for people in particularly sort of regional and remote areas. I think it would be really interesting to, I doubt you'd be able to get any real firm data on it but you'd, there'd certainly be anecdotal stuff around to what extent you know simple connectivity challenges are preventing people from really accessing this sort of stuff.
So, yeah, I think that's really, really important. And one of the, there's a few crucial partners that we're working on because, of course, e even within Australia, a lot of us might forget because we live in urban places with excellent connectivity. But in Australia, that's not the case for everybody. And one of the wonderful things about having access to the whole of Western Australia, the whole of South Australia, for example, is that we're, by coding those branches and having a look at the, the relative uptake of, in, of people in areas depending on the quality of the connectivity, we're going to be able to learn a little bit about that. Um, we're also working with the Northern Territory Library to make sure and, and use that hopefully as a case study to make sure that we more fully reflect um, the, the challenges that well, not only poor connectivity but also where you've got multiple Indigenous languages, for example, um, and even insecure supply of electricity, how that's <laughs> impacting. Yeah, it's a, definitely a whole other but, world but really valuable to study. And again, another reason why it's so wonderful having Julian Thomas involved, because he has such a background in these questions around the digital divide. So. Well, thank you very much, Rebecca and Kim, professors. <laughs>